We had some fun on this episode, Joe. Yeah, maybe maybe a little bit too much fun. Uh, maybe maybe simmer down a little bit there, Russ. <laughs> well, I don't know. Your open monologue <laughs> is a little bit interesting. <laughs> I'm just going to say if you have some uh, teenage kids around, you may want to remove them from this. There is some sexual innu- in- innuendo. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you really intended. That was not intended. Please. Yeah, it was bad. I think you had Ernie so stinking red. Like, I, <laughs> I mean, he didn't make a Georgia fan blush over there today. But that is not what we're talking about today. It is not. We were talking about ideas and ways to get our cash at work. A very unique way today. We brought up a concept of self-insuring against your cars and your auto insurance. Yeah, your love, cars and your home owns insurance. Yeah, I love the uh, the feedback from everybody because everybody, every one of us has a unique way of looking at each one of these topics. And man, I'll, I'll tell you what, Mark really challenged me on the way he answered that. He said, hey, by the way, this isn't just one size fits all. You need to make sure you think about the opportunity cost of both sides. Yep, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Right. So I love, I love that. And it, it makes me think kind of the, the impetus. Is that's how you say that word. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I'll go with it. Okay, cool. Usually you go against I'll, me. On I'll that. check. I'll check this one. Okay. Usually I'm going right. to put the kibosh on it. But, but the impetus of that concept for today really falls in line with my thinking of our dollars always have to be at work. They have to be active, not lazy. Yeah, well, that that actually makes me think of a story. Uh, Russ, you were there personally, but I'll share it to you who are listening. Um, when we would go travel, we would always go and uh, basically park our car at one of those park and ride places. And there was one time we got in late. I can't remember the exact circumstance. If we, it was, we went to a place that we normally went to, if you remember, and they had they they closed down. Remember, they they closed down. We were going to go to that one place, and we show up early. It's like six a.m. in the morning, and they were oh, not. They were no right. longer there. That's right. So we had to go to another park and ride place, brand new place, never been there before. But regardless, we get back into town. We're ready. We're tired. I mean, it's it's easily eleven, almost twelve o'clock at night. Yep. And so we're thinking, okay, we just get get our car, get home. We start calling, we're calling, we're calling. Nobody is answering the phone. So I'm calling the main office over and over and over again. Joey's on the website. He gets a different number. You're calling it. You're leaving voicemails. I'm leaving voicemails. And we're we're about a mile from the place, right? right? But this is not just any mile. No, if you're if you've ever been to any airport in almost any city, you know like it is literally not the place you want to be at at midnight. It's sketch. It's very sketchy. Right. Now, to add to it, the Birmingham airport has a cemetery right next to it. Okay. So, Russ and I, we were like, look, nobody's answering the call. What are we going to do? We got to at least get our car. So, what did we do? We asked, like, the the guy at the airport there, hey, do you think you can, the little airport shuttle guy, you think you can drive us down the road? He's like, technically, I can't get off of airport property. So, I can take you about a third of the way there, but you're going to have to walk the rest. Yeah, so we did. And this wasn't wise, like you said. I mean, we were not packing heat, okay? <laughs> now, we were packing. Well, I was hot. I was very heated. <laughs> I mean, imagine you're trying to call this place to pick you up, and you're calling for 15 to 20 minutes straight. Nobody's answering. So you're like, okay, I'm just going to walk down there. Carrying our luggage. Joey and I are pulling our little baggage behind us, you know, down <laughs> down the street, walking by a cemetery. And it seems like every step we take, we're closer to a crime scene, <laughs> closer to murder. And we walk up finally, and Russ is really frustrated. I'm I'm frustrated. We walk up to this place, and it's got I don't know if you can imagine, it's got like this little U turn into the the front part of the the place, and it, the whole front of it is glass. It's like an old like what my daddy would call a filling station, like an old gas station. Yes. Yeah. That's a perfect example. And so there's all cars parked everywhere all around the place, but right there in the front is just all glass. We walk up and sure enough, the guy that's supposed to be coming to pick us up to get our car is laid out. He's cashed out, bro. He is laid. I mean, at the desk, feet up on the desk. What he's, he's three bills, at least 300 pounds. And he's laid back, head back, just tossed back, feet up, 
and just sawing logs. Oh, uh, and I'm like, oh no, no, he has not. He's been sitting here asleep as we've been at the airport calling, calling, calling. I'm like, all right, Joe, get get your phone out. This is about to be like the funniest home videos worthy. And, and one of my biggest regrets is I didn't pull out the phone fast enough, didn't get it ready. I was a little, I was a little quick on the trigger. But then all of a sudden, Russ is rah, 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 on that window. <laughs> if you could have only seen this dude, just like I, he's never moved that fast in his life. Those three hundred pounds were tossed in the air. He was on his feet, running towards uh, who knows where. I, I'm sure he thought he was about to get assaulted. I mean, he didn't know what was happening. And what he do? He didn't come to the door to let us in. He runs out to the to the van to get the phone that he was supposed to have next to him to take our phone call. Yeah, the, he left it in the van. He had the phone, so he wasn't hearing the call because he left it in the van like an idiot. And he had gone to sleep inside, thinking, "Well, <laughs> I go to sleep, you know, it's okay. I can take a little nap over here. The phone will wake me up." Yeah, not a big deal. I've done this probably a hundred times before. Every night. Except he left the stupid phone in the van. And so then he's all disheveled. And it's such a small place. It's not like he has to go back, you know, 100 yards to go find our car. He just gives us the keys. The car is parked there. You know, we saw it as we walk up. And here, here's the beauty of this thing, too. He says, uh, I mean, uh, oh, I think uh, since, you know, uh, you guys had to wait, uh, I, I think, what, what, what do you guys say if I if I take a, I take a, I take a day off? I take a day off the bill. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, uh, bro, that doesn't work for me. How about all the days? <laughs> Take a hundred percent. Okay. I just put my life at risk to get my own stinking car. <laughs> Unreal. He's like, yeah, I think that sounds fair. That that, that sounds fair. It's Joe, Joey and I leave, but because you had left a voicemail on the corporate offices, which I think ended up being the owner's like personal cell phone. He didn't yeah. answer it because it was you know, like one o'clock or whatever. He, he calls you back the next day, didn't he? Yeah, I'm fairly certain uh, Big Boy does not have a job there at the park and ride. Because <laughs> he told you so, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, he said he's done. <laughs> That's it. Well, but, but hey, regardless, I hope that right now you have a picture that you would never, ever want your dollars doing what Big Boy did to us. Putting us at risk. Your dollars that are not moving and not active and not making money are putting you at risk every single day. Yeah. Get get your dollars active. Let's get into this episode. Let's belly up. Welcome to the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast, your guide to understanding how to get out of the Wall Street rat race and start your own mailbox money lifestyle. Now, don't let these handsome Southern draws fool you. These financial minds are teaching our country to enhance savings, increase cash flow, and create passive income, all without the help of Wall Street. Are you ready to break through? Now here are your hosts, Russ Morgan and Joey Murray. Welcome back to the IBC Roundtable, where each week we get to go deeper and deeper into your favorite subject, the infinite banking concept. I am one of your hosts, the idea guy, Russ Morgan. I'm surrounded by the best coaches in the industry, and I need to introduce them to you now. To my right, I got the Italian stallion. He's got a license plate to prove it, Mr. Joey Mure. What's up, Joey? Hey, hey. Happy to be here. Joey, we had the team here in town this week. What a privilege, man. That was awesome. It was amazing. I, I, I get so excited because, I mean, you get to hear it every week on the show. Uh, these guys know what in the world they're talking about. They are the experts as it relates to helping you get into this infinite banking world and helping you navigate these things. But man, just having everybody in the flesh, getting to see JD's incredible golf swing, you know, and Mark Haraguchi coming out of the woodwork and just crushing us all at Top Golf. I mean, it's just I just have so much more respect. I do. I have I have lots of respect for for Mark's golf skills. Not and, so much for JD's. And, for, and of course, we already knew Ernie. Oh wow, Ernie's mm -hmm. the sleeper of all of them. He just yeah. he comes up from the the behind and just starts crushing people. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got a lot in that uh, opening monologue from the stallion. I'm going to move on over 
to <laughs> to earn. Earn, try to follow that up. Welcome to the show, by the way. Downtown, uh, Ernie Brown. Thank yeah. you for being here. Yeah, thanks. Not gonna lie, today I feel like a dry sponge. Hmm. Allergies, man. Oh, I avoided it this long. I am. I'm suffering. A dry sponge. That is the first for me, Ernie. To go hop in the sauna, I think. Gotcha. Have you ever heard dry sponge, Joe? No, that that's the first for me as well. That's how I feel. Okay. All right. Well, very interesting. All right, let's let's go across the table. Let, let's get to the man who's got his beard back on. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that um, your golf game is not reflective of your uh, skills to coach one because you are Mr. Incredible in all things except golf, Mr. J.D. Hill. <laughs> What's up, J.D.? Uh, apparently not my golf score. That is that is not what is up. Um, although although I will I will say this because Ernie made a very good point. The object of golf is to have the lowest score, and I was successful in having the lowest score at Top Golf. So, <laughs> if anything, I won. <laughs> it, that Winner. is true. Yeah, it, there is a way to do that. Uh, Top Golf would be the opposite, but good, <laughs> good effort. Gr good to see you. All right, let's move over to the winner, uh, the man between two bamboos, our resident pilot, Mr. Mark Haraguchi. What's up, Mark? Not much, guys. But I, I you know, I, I did notice that after. Um, thoroughly destroying everyone on my you know corner of the of the top golf game that uh when i when when i got back yesterday and i woke up i was like man you know my my ribs kind of hurt and i'm trying to figure out how, how did i hurt those and then i realized it was just all that crushing i did from the tee box and apparently i have not played golf in a while because there were muscles i didn't even know i had mm. and apparently i used them for golf uh, <laughs> well i you know, we're, we're grateful there. There's a uh, medicine for that as well as creams. So, and, and because <laughs> now that you're, you know, you're only heavy lifting is, is helping people with finances. You're okay. You can do it. We, we'll make sure you get home. All right, let's, let's get into today's topic. We we've got to cover a wide range of things. Yep. Today's topic though, can I self-insure my car and, or my home Ernie? Jump in there. Yes, I do. Yes, you do. Wow. Okay. That's, that's so that's his the, first thought. That's coming off the top rope. JD? Uh, to answer the question directly, can I insure my automobile or my home? The answer is yes, you can. Um, yes. <laughs> okay. There's more there. This We're going to come back This is a deep subject, guys. Yeah, this is like Jack Handy moment right here. All right, Mark. I feel like this is set up perfect. Like each one is getting longer. So uh, yes, but it depends. <laughs> mm. um, uh, Joseph? I would say absolutely. Not to use everybody else's yes statement. Uh, but I would probably not choose to do your house. Your car? Yes. Not, not your house. Why that's not that's your my first thought. I, I, I say the same. I, I would say that I would definitely insure my car or self-insure my car, at least for the comprehensive part. But I, I don't think I would do the house. Okay. okay. What's your reason? Well, I just think there, that's a lot of, a lot of capital that I'd want to have sitting idle in, in the event that that thing were to happen. Right. And I don't want that much money sitting idle. I think, you know, the, there's an old adage that says, if you have the ability to write a check, you don't have a problem. Yep. If you can write a check to solve the problem, you don't have a problem. And I, I think for most people, they can get to a point where they can write a check for their car. The value of the house, so maybe a little bit too big. And I just think I, I would rather start, stop at the car. Well, I almost, I, it might be somewhat related to this. I mean, I'm just going to kind of throw it out there. You guys can totally dissect it. But I kind of liken it to the reason why I wouldn't pay cash for my house. Right? I, I want to leverage that. Uh, from a standpoint of I can use somebody else's money at a much lower interest rate and use my cash to do something else. It's similar in the thought of why would I self-insure my house if I can essentially leverage that risk at somebody else's you know lower interest rate or lower expense, basically. All right. So let's make sure for those who are tracking along with us at home, this could be your first episode. You're like, what are you idiots talking about? <laughs> I mean, I have heard a lot in a very short period of time here. 
But when you're you're talking about the opportunity to self-insure your car or your house, what we're saying is we usually farm that out to a third party, That's some right. insurance company. All they're doing is pooling cash from from others' premiums to account for the known losses. The people say, "Well, how do you know?" Because they got you know tons of data. Yeah, they they got tens or hundreds of years of data that they can they can work from. When it when it comes to natural disasters, to car crashes, they can look at that data and determine what will be the anticipated expense. So then, how much do we need to charge? Add in the cost of us doing business, plus throw in a, a little profit margin for the big guy, right? That that's the cost. Well, if we could take that same concept, if we're already pooling cash in a properly designed insurance contract, why couldn't we perform that same insurance function? Now, I would say there's one thing that I I did say I'd do it for a car, but I won't do it for my daughter's car. <laughs> I was going to say, is that for all your cars? I, I, that's, that's the one car right now I'm not going to, to self-insure. Not that I don't trust her as a driver, but as she gets ready to turn 16, I just know the statistics are not in her favor that she will get out of six, uh, age 16 without having a car accident, right? I just pray when she has it, it's not something that hurts her or anybody else, right? I mean, been in steel or plastic or whatever those cars are made up these days. Hey, that's okay. Right. So I, I would say that would be the one car I probably wouldn't self-insure is my daughter's car. I you know, I, I, I absolutely would not self-insure my wife's car either. She's, <laughs> she's good for an accident one every three years. Um, it's not very bad. You know, it's usually just uh, a little fender bender, but you know, I definitely would not uh, self-insure that one. I will say some things are worth paying the cost for. Right. So, so for example, I had a client once that carried a maxed out credit card all the time and only made minimum payments. And the reason was because if he paid it off, his wife would max it out again. And so, and so he kept it maxed out at all times, right. In an effort to prevent excessive spending. So he was willing to pay the interest because that was a small cost, right. To prevent the excessive spending. And so I think in context of this conversation, the same thing is also true. If, you know, depending on you know, you got to weigh the, the, the cost and, and the worth of uh, what are you, uh, do you, do you, how likely is it that you're actually going to have an accident uh, in that vehicle? All right. So really quickly, before we get into pros and cons of this, are we talking about like, for most people, they think of, well, I mean, my car is worth more than Joey's car, but, you know, but Joey in his car could do lots of damage. Are we talking about ensuring the damage that Joey could do to other people's cars? No, you can't cover that cost. That's a you, there, there's a legal requirement for you to protect other people. Well, you could self-insure, but you need to. Ha you, there's limitations in the state of Alabama. I don't know what it is today. I, when I, you know, my earlier former life, right out of college, I was uh, hawking cars. I was I was renting cars for Enterprise Rent a Car, and Enterprise actually self-insured. And the requirement at that time is that they had to have two million dollars of reserves on own deposit to be able to handle that. I don't know if that number has gone up, but you could ensure the liability as well. But most people I don't think would want to do that. So we're so only you, talking about insuring our cars. So you're talking about the liability portion, not the collision comprehensive coverage. Right. I would want to be comprehensively collision protected. Got it. Okay. All right, Ernie, tell me, <laughs> what, what do you think the pros and cons to self-insuring your automobile or car would be? Well, I'll tell you, but I'll just say, I love this topic because I feel like I've got the scar to show off. You know what I'm saying? You know, you have some, some life experience and it's like, I want to, I want to share about this. You got a prison tat. <laughs> no, I don't. Okay. All right. Just saying. But I do have the scars to, to tell about. So uh, to me, the, the reason that I want to keep the minimum amount of coverage and the highest deductibles it's because I like the lowest payment. The, the pro for me of self-insuring is I just hate throwing money away. I hate wasting money. I love efficiency. Uh, I love squirreling money away, as some people I've talked to you call it. And uh, that, I, I just don't like the idea of unnecessarily uh, putting that chance of me running in somebody else's car and having to replace my own. Um, I'm willing to take that chance and take the cash and keep it. 
So have you done this yourself? Yeah. And what's been the result so far? Three for three. <laughs> three for three. <laughs> I mean, that's that's pretty good if, uh, you know, if you're a, you know, major league uh, hitter at one night. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not if you're the ball. <laughs> <laughs> so the last year and a half, uh, not one person, not two people, but three different people have run into my my cars. You're a magnet. I, I, I really am. What a people guy. <laughs> yeah. And I'm I sure just all, love meeting people. <laughs> I'm sure all of these people had insurance, though. Yeah. Not only one of them. <laughs> one out of one three. for so three. Two, two of the three. Are you still good no if coverage. you're a major league hitter? One out of three. <laughs> Which would be somebody's worst nightmare, right? That's the whole reason people think about this topic and they're like, no way, right? But the reality is you sort of got leverage in that situation. And so number one, I think in those accidents, the first one was the worst. I got slammed, Mm -hmm. concussed, you know, it wasn't fun. Totaled my car. I feel like the Lord really gave me a lot of grace in that moment, not to blow up, but to really treat the other person with a lot of dignity and calm kindness. First one was a, was a girl and she was pretty upset Mm -hmm. and yeah, I just feel like the Lord gave me um, a presence of mine to be calm and to deal with her well. And just in how I dealt with her, she ended up paying me cash. She, we set up a little payment plan and and we got 90%. Fortunately on that last payment, I didn't hear from her, (laughs) but I'll call that a win. And the second one was insured. The third one, was this guy and and he was uh, delivering food and he he backed into my car and uh, he wasn't delivering my food <laughs> and he backed into my car. <laughs> but knowing that the the deal was, hey, we can call the police and we can get a report and you're going to get a ticket and you're going to lose your job or you can pay me and we can go around that. And again, I think number one, I dealt with him with dignity, but just having that presence of mind was able to negotiate. I was able to use my position and, and it worked out. He he ended up paying me. Did you also have a baseball bat? No, no. I was the ball in this situation. He was the bat. Got it. Uh And you had a third one in there. That was the third one. Oh, that was the third one. Yeah. The second was a girl. She was insured. So, okay. Her, her dad's coverage took care of it. Okay. I've heard enough about infinite banking. I'm pretty sure it's a fit for me and my family, Russ. How do I get started? Let's take that pretty sure and make it darn sure. The reason you do that is that you get clarity, Joe. You need to get on a 15-minute call with one of our coaches at wealthwellwallstreet.com forward slash free call. Then you'll know where you're starting from and where you're headed. And only then can you implement the infinite banking process. All right. So go to wealthwellwallstreet.com forward slash free free call to get that 15 minute conversation, gain clarity. But now let's jump back into today's episode. All right. All right. JD, give me some pros and cons from your angle of self-insurance. Yeah, I think the the, the pros to self-insuring is if you're a good driver, um, you know, because we can't necessarily pretend to know what anybody else is going to do. Case in point, Ernie was the ball three times, <laughs> right? So we, we don't have any control over that, but you know, in terms of our own uh, abilities to, to be a safe driver, especially when you look at the cost of insurance and those types of things, which from my perspective, you know, when you look at insurance in general, it, it, what it is is a transfer of risk, right? And if I'm, if I'm buying insurance, what I'm wanting to do is, is protect the loss of the asset. Or in this case, I don't know if you'd consider a car an asset, but you want to protect the loss of that of that vehicle. So uh, oftentimes people have low deductibles, which is what creates high premiums, right? That's the primary driver in, in car insurance premiums is that deductible. And so I've seen people with 250 and 300 or $400 deductibles. Um, I carry $1,000 or more deductible on my vehicles. Uh, because I know the higher I lift that up, the more actual coverage I can actually get on my vehicles uh, with the least amount of cost possible. Uh, and so if you understand what the insurance companies are doing and, and um, you know, what those levers are, you, know, you, can, you can either self-insure, uh, which I think is, is, is a good thing to do on the, at least the collision side for uh, an accident that were to take place on the, the liability side. If there's an injury 
to someone else, I mean, that, that could be extensive and expensive where, you know, to Ernie's point, I wouldn't want to necessarily self-insure that because that could be a big liability um, that could uh, really, really hurt you financially. Um, well, I would say, you know what? I think a lot of people are self-insuring on the liability side, at least for a large, large percentage of it. All right. What do you mean? Because when you look at, well, one, do you know what your liability coverage limits are? Yes. Uh, I, I have it times. So right now you do not know how much your liability limit covers. I, I, I don't file that away in my memory. No, okay. I have it. I have it saved somewhere. I would, I would say for the average person, we don't know. So as you're listening to this, I will challenge you right now to either go look it up or call your insurance agent and ask them what are the liability limits of my insurance policies, my, my automobile policy. Because the legal limit, right, the legal requirement in most states is as low as $30,000 for all things, right? There's, there's a couple of things it's covering. It's covering people issues. It's covering property issues. But then they have a total coverage, right? And I think in Alabama, I don't know what it is in Texas, Washington, but it is like $30,000. Well, you can't hit anything, right? <laughs> And, and and especially if a lawsuit got involved and be thirty thousand dollars or less, that's just not going to happen. But yet, when we don't have that coverage in place, which you were saying a second ago, Jay, you were saying I want to be a Walmart shopper. I want to spend as little as I can get at the highest coverage. I think a lot of people try to spend as little as they can. And on the liability side, I'd say that's the area not to scrimp on, right? Like, don't scrimp on that part because that's the thing that wealth is really easily to be transferred in transactions like that because what you don't have protected can be taken away from you. And that's a really easy way that we've talked about getting in car wrecks. We literally can do lots of damage with these cars. And if we're not protecting ourselves, one, by having our own personal automobile limits as high as they possibly can be. And then two, I'm going to spend some more of your money right now is go buy you an umbrella policy. Yeah. I mean, you can get a $2 million umbrella policy that will cover then and over the over and above whatever your liability limits are up to another $2 million. And what do you spend? $300 a year? Something like that. I mean, it's like 180, 200. Yeah, it's, it's just stupid. It's not, it's, it's not a whole lot of money, but that's the thing that we're not taught. Like these aren't things unless you, you know, are an insurance agent, you don't know these things. And I, I see that people make those mistakes. Ernie, to you're which, over there ready to jump uh, in there too. Ahead, also, just, just one last point on that, because even myself, I had no idea about this until I got connected with somebody that did property and casualty insurance, and we met over not business, so it wasn't a sales meeting, which was nice. So I got to ask some questions to understand like what's really going on behind the scenes. And one of the biggest gaping holes that most people don't recognize is the uninsured, underinsured yep. element of, of uh, auto insurance, and that's the piece that protects you. Right, that's the piece that if you're the ball, right, that that your insurance policy will actually protect you if you're the ball. And candidly, not to sound too selfish here, but that's the piece that I really care the most about. Right, is if I get into an accident with someone else and they don't have enough coverage, I want to make sure that me and my family or whatever passengers are in my vehicle, they're going to be okay, and my insurance will be able to take care of that in the event that there's can. So that uninsured, underinsured piece is so important, um, and so generally your liability coverage should equal the same thing as your uninsured, underinsured. When I, and I love what we're, we're getting at today in today's topic, because when we're talking about financial freedom, we are talking about both the passive income side, having to build that up and your monthly expenses at the same time. Well, I think like what you're just mentioning there, there are levers when it comes to automobile and home coverage that we need to be considering in order to maximize and optimize even something like a premium on a, a car insurance or on a home insurance. And, you know, what would you guys say is like the typical difference if you were able to insure against your own comprehensive collision type of coverage, instead of dictating that or, or allocating that to an insurance company, what would be the average difference in cost per year somebody could save just so if they're thinking, okay, is this even worth it? What would you say? Earn? We, we talked about this, I think on auto insurance, $500 a year savings. If you just had liability on there, if you want to do the underinsured, uninsured motorist 
uh, the comprehensive and collision 500 a year. Okay. So just thinking about that, like immediately, that's a quick win. If you're listening to this and you're thinking, how am I getting closer to financial freedom? I mean, that's not incredible, but that's 40 or $50 a month on that monthly expense side that you just, you just took care of. Maybe you didn't even know. Now add to that like home insurance, like Mark, I think you and I were talking about this. Um, what are some options people have on that side of things? I don't know, Joey. Well, I mean, like from a deductible standpoint, like we just talked about the uh, yeah, adding I, the, the certain well, coverages on the car, but on the home, maybe it's not as as cut and dry. Well, before we jump to that, I, I, I want to make sure there's a clarifier for what we just said there. If If you go and remove that collision off of your auto, okay, if you go and total your car, how are you going to replace that? So if you're planning on, on removing that coverage, you need to make sure you have that, those dollars in reserve to be able to replace that vehicle. So like for me, um, you know, $50,000 truck, right? Okay, so you got a truck, it's 50 grand. All right, that means I need to have at least 50 grand sitting in a pot ready to go in case I total that thing. So now you've got to ask yourself, all right, is that $500 I'm going to save this year? Okay, that's great. But if I've got that 50 sitting on the side, well, what did that having that $50,000 sitting there idle cost me? Well, I, I saved $500 in my car insurance, but could I have deployed that 50 grand, gone and gotten an asset, create cash flow to not only pay to replace that 50 grand, but also pay for the auto insurance and leave me a little bit of you know cash flow on the side? Well, if it is, okay, now we're getting into well, what does it really cost? What do your dollars cost? And we don't like money sitting around doing nothing. Um, so the other area we go is like what JD had mentioned is let's raise the deductible. Well, if I raise the deductible now, yeah, I'm now instead of keeping 50 grand in reserve, what if I keep a thousand dollars in reserve? So cool. I've got $1,000 sitting in reserve. I've raised my deductible up to a thousand. Maybe I've now, now maybe I've saved like a hundred bucks on my car insurance, but now I've got $49,000 I can go deploy. Well, I like what you're saying to too, that I think there's lots of levers. I just remember my mother always, and until this conversation came up and I started really applying this in my own personal finances, maybe about 15 years ago where I, I heard, you know, this conversation happened at a financial conference and it, it was in one of the same conferences when I first heard Nelson, but wasn't really listening to what he was talking about. But this was a, a really uh, one of those little small areas I kind of dialed in on where they were talking about, hey, what are you paying for your car and your homeowner's insurance? And what's the likelihood of you having an accident that totals it as compared to whatever? And I just I went and, and sat down with my mom, you know, early in my little financial planning days. And I went through her coverages and she had a two hundred fifty dollar deductible on her car. And had always, and I asked her, how long had you been carrying that? And she goes, as, as long as I know, right? And I was like, well, why did you want 250? Well, because I didn't feel like I had a whole lot of extra money. She's a school teacher. Didn't, didn't, didn't feel like I had a whole lot of extra money in the event that, you know, it was $1,000. It'd be hard for me to come up with $1,000. So that was her logic. But yet it was costing her a significant amount of money. And when we went through it, not only did we um, go back and get her car insurance reshopped, right? Because car insurance is one of those commodities that you probably should shop every two or three years, because it is amazing that when you keep at one carrier, they start jacking your rates up. It's like cable, right? <laughs> I mean, you should reshop your cable or internet service every two or three years, because that is a way to save some money. If you, if you got a 16 year old, that'll do it for you. But that, that was one of those things where I saw there to be some decent money because her homeowner's insurance was at $500. Her car insurance was at $250 deductible. And yet we started at that point putting money into an insurance contract to save this money. And it didn't take very long for us. I said, mom, look, we got this excess money. You know, the difference between $250 and $1,000, $750. Well, we've got all of that here. Do you think you feel comfortable raising your deductible up and being able to keep every dollar that you were paying in the difference and put it in your pocket, even if that's just one meal, one nice little meal a month, mm -hmm. right? It, what, what's the, like, if you already or have created the function to be your own insurance company, be your own bank, why would we farm that off to someone else? It doesn't make any sense. And, 
And from that logic, I've I've seen it applied in lots of different ways. Mark, you were going to go deeper. I'm sorry, to cut you off there. Though. Uh, that's that's exactly it. And this goes to the point of of Nelson's comment about the infinite banking concept, right? How many people that are listening to this podcast hopped on thinking we were going to talk about car insurance? Wait a minute, I, th I thought you guys were talking about becoming your own banker and getting passive income strategies. And well, isn't this a, a holistic approach? This is looking at everything that you do and finding these creative opportunities. And this could be an opportunity for you. Maybe you don't have the, the total cost to replace your car. That perfect. But maybe now you can fall into that bucket where Russ's mom was. Do you have enough cash value sitting around? Could you increase your deductible? And now you start to get a few extra bucks back. Now you don't have to pay as much for your insurance. And what are you doing? You're starting to create tailwinds for yourself. You're changing your mindset. You're, you're changing your entire thought process to push you closer to where you want to be. Because you got to ask yourself, what I'm, what I'm doing today, is that getting me closer or is that getting me farther from my vision of financial freedom? Well, and that's all we're playing. We're playing a game of cash flow here, right? And every little way that you can whittle off the right side of that equation, the monthly expenses, that does not reduce your lifestyle, right? And I don't know anybody who has sent a dollar to an insurance company for the purpose of true, pure insurance, right? I know Protection what, insurance. That, the way that we set it up, we don't, we're buying cash, not insurance, but I don't know anybody that wants to overpay for their protection, right? We, we have that Walmart shoppers mindset that we said a second ago. I don't know anybody wants to overpay an in interest. I don't know anybody wants to overpay for taxes. Those are items that if we can just whittle away as small as it may be, what happens is, is that flywheel approach, right? Every single revolution that we, we implement and apply this in our life gives us that momentum to do much more the next time. And that's what I think this is about is a lifestyle is about a mindset. And when you see these little wins, these quick wins in your life, this is a, a really easy one. Someone can do probably in the first year of setting up their whole becoming your own banker process is they probably could self-insure a car. There's probably at least one car in your family that's not worth $20,000 or more. You most likely can get to a point in the first year that you would have the ability, if you wanted to, to self-insure, whether it's the full amount or, like we talked about a second ago, just a deductible. Yeah, and the other thing I'll add to that is that this is really more in line with what we're talking about every, every day on this show is you're, the way you think has to change, right? If the, if everybody is always doing the same thing, you, you don't have to keep following the same uh, process. You're not going to end up in a different place, right? So even just implementing some of these little small things are part of continuing to be outside of the box. Infinite banking concept, infinite is the part that we want to emphasize today is you need to be thinking outside of the norm and having a different result. So, um, yeah, I'm glad we're talking about something like this because, hey, we take it for granted that, you know, you don't have been doing this sort of thing with our deductibles and things like that for a long time. But if you've been stuck, you set this up on your house 10 years ago, and now you're like, well, I didn't even think about that. This is an easy thing you could do this afternoon. Ah, man, it's like that T-shirt idea I had, to infinite banking and beyond. <laughs> It is nothing like that. <laughs> All right, let's go parting shots downtown. Well, I think what this this makes me think about is we're getting control of cash. We're building a pool of cash. And if we are overspending, whereas we could self-insure, we might have found a leak in our bucket. And whereas as water is flowing away from us or as cash is flowing away from us unnecessarily, if we can plug that and keep access more to it, then I think what Mark was talking about, we can take that cash and we can go deploy it. And when we remove our cash position to trade it for a cash flow, well, there's the cash flow to up our coverages if we need to. But now we've got other people's money paying for our own coverage. And that's where we really want to be. Mm, love that. Mr. Incredible. Yeah, I think that was very well said. Um, I think for me, what was impactful is it's, it's, um, not being 
one dimensional as you approach infinite banking, right? But being three or four dimensional and looking at um, all your dollars in your entire economy, right? And what they're doing um, and, and uh, just, just being more aware and how you make those financial decisions is ultimately going to put you in such a wonderful, unique position to get that much closer to financial independence. Mm. Mark, ditto. <laughs> All right. My, my last thought is this, and it's just furthering that last point, but I'm, I'm hoping that something like this will challenge you to start thinking about what other areas could I be taking control of that maybe I'm not currently today. I'll, I'll add this uh, from when I first started learning about infinite banking, I had one application in mind and I started a policy with that in mind. It was about giving. We've talked about this on the show. But within that next year, I was like ravenously looking for ways to increase my system. Like, I mean, Russ probably got tired of me calling him or texting him or, um, you know, hitting him up on my Bluetooth headset uh, that was attached to my ear all the time and just saying, hey, can I, can I do this with a policy? Can I do this? And some of them were really dumb ideas. I mean, admittedly, super dumb. But it was the fact that I was thinking and I was trying to apply this new knowledge of, man, money is leaking. I need to get it into a reservoir that will constantly grow for the rest of my life and into generations to come. It's urgent. Like, I got to get, get after this. So hopefully this is one of those things that will kind of get that going for you. All right. My, my last point, and it's just a thought that's been resonating with me this week. And I, I think I, I see you, Ernie, and I know what you've been doing for the last couple of years, being really focused and accomplishing one task and that stacking cash, getting yourself in a position to be able to take advantage of all these ideas. And I heard it said I was watching a really pretty successful, famous real estate investor, Ed Milet, and he was on a, I don't know if it was a podcast I was watching or what, uh, whatever it was, but anyway, he said a lot of times people watch the wealthy and they see that they're doing all these different things with their money. And they assume that what I should do with my money is diversify because that's what the wealthy do. And he said, but that's not how the wealthy became wealthy. The wealthy actually became wealthy by doing one thing really well and crushing that one thing. And then once they actually became wealthy, then they started diversifying where they were putting their dollars. And I think from what we're talking about here, the, the underbelly of this or the, the, the backbone to this, maybe a better analogy, is that we need to be putting in ourselves in such a position of cash that we have the ability to make these sort of decisions in our life that truly can help us create new streams of income and reduce monthly expenses, but you got to be in that position. So Ernie, well done. Thank you everyone on, on the podcast for the contribution today. I apologize for my speech gaffes over and over, <laughs> but as we jump in now, I, I'm going to give you a call to action. If you're not already a member of our inner circle, you got an opportunity. Go to wealthwildwallstreet.com forward slash inner circle, and you can hear the recording of the Q&A that's about to happen live. Every single week you get access to these coaches. You can ask any question that you want. Not that they'll give you the answer, but they will give you a response. And to me, this is an opportunity for you to be around people on the same journey to get that. And there's all sort of amazing tools and resources that we're constantly adding into this community that is the inner circle. So go to wealthwildwallstreet.com forward slash inner circle. As always, have an amazing day. This has been the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show to break free of the Wall Street mindset and begin building wealth on your own terms in places you understand so that your wealth will never run dry. See you next episode.